auspicious occasion. We've come together because of this, um, we say, papa offering. Pa means cloth, ba means forest, so forest cloth offering. It's a tradition since the time of the Buddha um, for monks who live in the forest. They have to um, seek out their cloth, the cloth to make their robes. Um, because forest monks, we live very simply, as you just heard. We don't handle money, we don't have funds, we don't have bank accounts and so on. All we need really is a bowl and cloth to, to be a monk in terms of requisites. Not very much at all, but even cloth, especially in some places where the population are quite poor. It's not always easy to come by. And so in terms of um, the Buddha's intention for Buddhist monks was that we should not be a burden on the lay community. We should try to get by with the minimum. So we have an allowance to use Bang Sakula Chiwarani, as you all just chanted, which means cast off cloth. And so traditionally monks would go wandering and find discarded cloth in rubbish piles by the side of the road, anywhere where cloth has been chucked out that no one wants. And we're allowed to pick it up, take it back to the monastery, dye it, clean it, dye it, and sew it together into our robes. And you'll see our robes have these kind of patched um, patterns, stripes, because originally they might have been made up of many individual small pieces of cloth. Um, another way this tradition has developed is also forest cloth also means cloth that came from corpses, wrapped around corpses before cremation. The cloth would be pulled off just before the fire was lit and hung on a tree in the forest and monks could again come along and just pick that cloth up because it's obviously something nobody wants take it away and make it into a robe so that's how this tradition has been handed down to us it's a way of supporting monks with cloth offerings so robes have been offered today um, but over the ages we've now had the development that we live in a money economy. So in the old days it might be a barter economy, people might not even have used much money. But these days they do, so now you get the advent of the money tree. That's how this has come about. So what it's referring to is the support for the Sangha. Um, so in a modern monastery there may be still bills to pay and so on, so you have a committee and people will offer funds for the bills and the various expenses of the monastery. But we shouldn't lose sight of the, the heart of the ceremony, which is actually simplicity. Monks just need some, some cloth, even old discarded cloth, and they can make that into a robe. We don't need a lot of things to be a Buddhist monk. You don't need a lot of possessions and um, equipment and expensive things. And the essence of our life is simplicity and renunciation. So it's not always an easy life. Um, if you've ever had the chance, say like I have as a monk, to wear corpse cloth, you know, corpse cloth, cloth you pulled off a corpse, washed it, sewn it, dyed it into a robe, it's not a pleasant thing because every day it reminds you of your own um, impermanence. You know, none of us live forever. We, we have to live in this world for a period of time then we all must depart from this world and that's why the monks do this practice. It's a meditation. You wear a corpse cloth every day you're reminded of your own impermanence that you're heading towards your death so that you become have a sense of urgency and become diligent and careful in your practice and don't waste your time with frivolous things because you know your, your time is limited. And that's why we're here today. We're all here to do good because we know we, we live in this world. What's the most important thing for us? Well, the Buddha's answer to that was, we say, making merit. It's a word you hear a lot but maybe don't think about all the time. What does it mean, making merit? In Thai we say tambun. In Sinhalese we say bun. In English we say merit. And what does that mean? Well, merit literally means the happiness, the joy that arises in your heart when you do good things, good actions. It means a sense of 
wholesome pride. You've done something good, you know you've done something good, you feel good about what you've done. It's that joy that comes up in the mind that we are developing through our lives, through our skillful actions. Supporting the Sangha is one very important way of making merit. And it's a very rare kind of merit because there's not that much Sangha in the world. And there are people who've renounced the lay life to live in the forest and practice for the end of suffering, which is a very rare and special thing. So to support Sangha, the Buddha said, is a very great merit. But we make merit in many ways. If you have a family, you can make merit with your family, looking after your family well, being kind, helpful, generous to your family, your relatives, your friends, to those in society who are less fortunate than you, the sick, the poor, the needy. We make merit at work, just doing our job the best we can, putting our best effort into the job we do, being patient with the difficulties, being careful what we say and we do when we do meet with obstacles and problems. This is merit. So the Buddha talked about many, many ways we make merit. It's all coming back to the heart, our, our mind, our heart, and it brings us joy. When we do something good, we feel good. You know, sometimes people in Buddhism, they have doubts, because all, we all talk about karma, you know, do good, good results, do bad, bad results. And so people try to do good and avoid doing bad things, evil things, but then they have doubts, because maybe they see someone who still does some bad things, but it seems like they get good results. And then we have doubts and we say, it's not fair. <laughs> Those people, they did so many bad things, but look at them now, they're rich, powerful, successful. This is just a superficial understanding of the situation. Merit really arises in your heart. And Ajahn Chah used to say, I've never been disappointed with this. If you do something good, you immediately feel good in your heart. If you're aware of what you're doing at that moment, you'll feel good, you'll feel happy. Already you're experiencing the results of the good action you're doing. There may be other factors in life, meaning sometimes people do good, but they still encounter problems and suffering. It's because there's many different factors, different aspects to their life giving results. But you do good, you'll feel good immediately. If your mind is truly in a wholesome, a good state, you'll immediately feel happy from the action you've done. A small act of kindness, supporting monks, uh, meditation, or just being restrained in your day so you don't lose your temper. All of these are examples of doing good and you feel the, the result straight away. We don't need to doubt that. And another reason we have these ceremonies, we come together, you might think, why do we all have to come together, make food, offer things? Some people might think it's, you know, that the monks do it because they enjoy it. They just want lots of people bringing them things. It's not like that. The purpose of these ceremonies is to bring people together. Sometimes you need some structure, some form. You have a program, you have a ceremony. And what does it produce? It produces a good feeling in each of our hearts. And then we also are connecting with other people who are doing good. So we feel happy as a group we get support, we feel confident. You see other people doing good, it inspires you and helps you to do good in your own life when you see other people being generous or you see other people keeping precepts, you see other people meditating, you get some energy and inspiration from that. In Thai we have a phrase, we say yati dhamma. Yati means like relatives, so relatives in the dhamma. So like today we're all here, we're all like one, you could say, big happy family, relatives in the Dhamma. And it doesn't matter if we've come from different countries, backgrounds. At this time, at this place, we all have something similar in common. We, we all have this aspiration to support Sangha, to make merit, do good for ourselves, for others around us. So we're like relatives in the Dhamma. We come together to do good. Today I've met a few people that I haven't seen for many years. And you meet and it's like there's still a very immediate connection because you're meeting in a situation where you're doing good. 
it's like relatives, isn't it? When you, you meet again, even if you haven't seen for many years, you feel good, you feel happy, you have a similar aspiration and attitude in your mind. And this is a very supportive thing in our practice, our individual practice. So you can come to Dhammagiri Hermitage and make offerings, meet fellow Dhamma practitioners. So it's like your extended family. And this is a very wholesome thing. It brings a lot of nourishment to our mind. It's good. It's good for us. But one thing Ajahn Chah used to remind everybody is that merit, you know, there's different levels and different kinds of merit. And the highest merit is developing some wisdom and understanding from the practice of Dhamma. Not just from the books, that's a good start, or from teachers but actually putting into practice what we've heard. There's even merit, he used to say, you can, you can get drunk on merit, get intoxicated with merit. And you, sometimes you see people say, sort of, we've got to make merit, we've got to make merit. <laughs> and, and they kind of forget themselves in the midst of making merit. So they become happy, but they get lost in the happiness. And then sometimes when the situation changes, suddenly they feel sad again, they feel like they've lost everything maybe because they weren't so mindful and aware of some of the, the deeper truths. Uh, we make merit, but we also have to remember we live in this world, it's an impermanent world that we live in. The friends, the family we live with, we won't be together forever. We, we, we separate at the end of our lives. Um, so the, and Ajahn Chah used to remind us we must listen to the Dhamma and then come to practice the Dhamma, practice mindfulness and reflect on these deeper truths to help us um, to, he used to say, to look after our merit. He said it's a bit like meat and salt, like in northeast Thailand where it's hot, a bit like Brisbane you could say, or even hotter than Brisbane. If you have meat, if you don't put salt in it to preserve it, your meat will go rotten very quickly in the sun. You need some salt. You need some wisdom to look after your merit. So we come, we do good here today. We go home. If we don't do any more, think about merit anymore, we go back. Maybe very quickly our mind can become caught into more um, coarser, unwholesome mental states. Maybe fall back into greed or anger or complaining or worrying about things. It's very easy to slip away from the merit we've made. We need the salt to preserve it, the, the salt to preserve the meat, and that is wisdom. We need to really think about the teachings and apply some of that wisdom in daily life. As we go home, we have to um, see the value of keeping the precepts, not just in the temple, in the monastery. You go home, we should try and practice the five precepts at home. See the value of meditating when we go home. As you meditate, your mind becomes more aware, more calm. You can see um, where real stress and suffering arises, which is in, in our own heart through our own negative thinking. The Buddha said, if you practice mindfulness every day, you'll find there are times when your mind becomes very calm and you can see clearly thoughts arising, passing away. And he said, whatever feeling or emotion or thought is impermanent and you can see it's impermanent, it's anicca, you can see that thought, that feeling is not self. Because what is impermanent can't really belong to you. you know, sometimes it's easy to see that with external things. You, know, you get something and then you give it away or you lose it or you break it. You can say, oh it's impermanent, it's not mine anymore, it's gone. With material things we can see that but with our own internal attachments to our thoughts, our feelings, that's more, more subtle. We need to practice mindfulness and meditation, maybe every day would be best. To keep returning to our state of mind to see, oh, these thoughts I keep getting attached to that cause me all kinds of stress and worry, greed, anger, oh, these actually are impermanent mental states. They're not there all the time. They arise, they cease. If you have enough awareness to see that, you can let go. If you can see something's impermanent, you can let go of it. You can see it doesn't, it's not really you, it's not, not any lasting self or person. 
So this is what you might say the highest merit learning to develop that kind of understanding or insight because this is what frees our mind from suffering. You know, if you have a thought of anger or worry and you have enough insight to say this is impermanent, this is not self, and you let go of it. Sometimes people think about the Buddha or an enlightened teacher like Ajahn Chah and they think, oh, enlightenment is just so high up, so far away. Um, and then we, we use that as an excuse not to do any practice. We say, oh, it's too difficult. Meditation, too difficult. Keeping precepts, too difficult. Listening to the Dhamma, too difficult. It's for those people who can, you know, they've got their very high minds. It's not for me. Ajahn Chah used to say, you know, realizing the Dhamma is not something necessarily very high. It's something very ordinary, very close by. Like if you you're in a situation, say you drive home from here along the road and there's someone driving very badly in front of you and you get angry. If you have a moment of mindfulness at that moment and you realize, I'm getting angry, I'm suffering, it's not going to change the person driving badly in the road or whatever. I'm the one suffering with my anger. If you can see that, at that moment you become mindful, you let that thought go. You know, there's no point holding on to your anger because you're just suffering. If you can see that, that's realizing the Dhamma. That's exactly the same wisdom that the Buddha had whenever he was letting go of his attachments. What brought him to be enlightened is exactly that same process. It's just he kept doing it until he finally gave up all his anger, all his attachment, greed, suffering. This is what we have to do. We have to bring our attention back to our own minds all the time to see our own mental states, the states of suffering, and, and see they're impermanent. They can be let go of if we're mindful enough. Another reason we come to the monastery, we don't just do ceremonies, we come to listen to Dhamma. And that helps remind us what we have to do. Because, to be honest, we're all the same, we keep forgetting. <laughs> You know, we go home and we forget everything that the monk said, we forget the meditation we did, and we get caught back into all our normal habits. And it's not that it's all bad, but sometimes we get very confused or end up worrying, stressed, because different things happen in our life. So we need to hear the Dhamma. And the Buddha said it's very important to come and listen to the Dhamma, because it's what gives you this wisdom in the beginning. The term he used, paradokosa, means listening to the Dhamma from the noble ones, the good Dhamma, the Dhamma that makes sense, that we can take and apply to our daily, daily lives. Meeting with wise people, fellow Dhamma practitioners, helps us through meeting people who provide a good example, like bhikkhus, but not just bhikkhus, lay people as well. People who provide a good example, people who can help explain what we, what we have to do. Listening to Dharma very important. Last week we had the funeral of the Thai king, who any of the Thai people and many of non-Thais will know is somebody who had great faith in the Buddhist teachings and supported the Buddhist religion throughout his entire life as, as um, a king. You know, 70 years he was reigning over Thailand. As a story, um, you might say a legend, but a story people believe in that when the king first became king, he was very young, back in the 1950s, and he didn't yet know many monks. Um, he had faith in Buddhism, but he was brought up overseas, so he hadn't had a lot of contact with the monks yet. And he was just becoming interested in Buddhism because he could see how useful it was. If you are in a position to be a new king in a country, he didn't have anyone to really be his patron or guide. He had to learn for himself what to do. So it's a quite a challenging situation. He could see the value of the Buddhist teachings because the Buddha would teach kings as well as everybody else. And the Buddhist teachings apply to a king just as anybody else. And he realized these Buddhist teachings could help him and also help the country. You know, they're good for the country when people learn what the Buddha taught. But he had one doubt, and his doubt was, are there any enlightened monks left in Thailand? Because who can know which monk is enlightened, or which nun, or which layperson? There may even be enlightened lay people, we don't know, but how can you know? 
if we're not enlightened, we can't really be sure, can we? It takes one to know one. <laughs> you have to be enlightened to know if someone else is enlightened. But people want to know. We say uh, you make merit with enlightened people. It's very powerful, good merit. And we want to hear Dhamma from enlightened teachers. But how do you know? So the king was in the palace and he, he made what we call an aditana. It's like a vow or a wish. And he wanted to know, are there any arahants left in Thailand? And there's you know, hundreds of thousands of monks. And there's reputed to be arahants, but he doesn't know who. So he made this wish. It was a solemn vow. He bowed to the Buddha. He, in his meditation, he made this wish. And he put a condition on it. He said, if there's an arahant still in Thailand, may one visit the palace within three days. So it's a big ask. And the way monks visit, whether it's a house or a palace, is we do alms. We go out with our bowl for alms. And so the next morning he got his staff, they got food, and they were waiting at the front of the palace in Bangkok. Would a monk come? No monk came. They hadn't invited anyone, they were just going to see if anyone would turn up, no one came. Second day, same, there with food, no one came. Third day, the king was called out on an urgent business, he couldn't get out of it. So he gave instructions to his assistants, he said, do what we did the last two days, get the food ready and wait. If any monk comes, note down their name, where they live, the, the monastery, remember what they look like. This is the 1950s, so they didn't have an iPhone to take a selfie. <laughs> so he did that, he gave the instruction, and off he went on this urgent business, and the staff were there, and sure enough, a monk came along. An older monk came walking down the street, stopped, received arms from them. So quickly they asked, you know, what's your name? Venerable Sir, where do you live, Venerable Sir? And his name was Venerable Fun, who the Thais will know is a very famous enlightened master. He lived in Sakonikon. Just turned up like that. Maybe he knew something. Maybe the devas, the angels arranged it. We don't know. But he turned up. So they got his name, his address. And then when the king returned later in the day, first thing he asked is, did a monk come? Yes. Oh. <laughs> so where does he live? Sakonikon, which is like 500 kilometers from the palace. So, oh, okay, well, we better arrange to go and visit. So he flew there by helicopter, because he's a king. This is, you know, a little time later. And before, he's a very smart king, before he went into the monastery, he asked all the local people, what's Venerable Fun like? And they say, oh, Lumpur Fun, they call him Lumpur. He's enlightened and he has great psychic powers, he can read your mind. He's enlightened monk, no more greed, no more anger. He's such, such a f peaceful, happy monk. You know, we're sure he's enlightened. So the king was very heartened by this. He's very happy to hear this because he's just asking the ordinary people. And he's a man of the people. He would get down or talk to people um, in the way he um, conducted himself. He's very humble and very ordinary. So then he went to the monastery and met Lumpur Phan and that began his association with the forest monks of Thailand. Before that he didn't know them. And Lumpur Phan is a disciple of Lumpur Man, who's on our shrine here, one of the many disciples. So the king started to visit all of them, one by one, all in remote forest areas. So it was a cause for the king to go into the remote forest areas, meet the local people as well, help them, because he helped set up irrigation projects, agriculture, distribute arms, support the monks, and most of all, listen to Dhamma. Even a king sees the value of listening to Dhamma from wise people. So he went to practice meditation and listen to Dhamma from all the leading meditation masters of Thailand throughout his whole reign. And that was back in the 50s, right through the 60s, 70s, 80s right up to the end of his life. He had great respect for monks and would visit them. This is a wise person. They see the value of listening to the Dhamma, so you get the answers to your questions, you get advice, you get guidance, and then putting it into practice. And 
There's many other stories I could tell you about the, the, the king, but he was somebody very dedicated to the practice of meditation and using it in his daily life. Like sometimes as monks, people come and they, you know, they have their problems, family problems, work problems, health problems, money problems. It's normal, we all have problems. So they come and ask the monk for advice and they say, oh, my life, too busy, too much going on, too much responsibility. And then you think, hmm, even the king of Thailand, 70 million subjects, 4,000 charity projects, all kinds of things he's doing. He still found time to meditate, still had time to, to go and seek out advice for the Dhamma. So maybe when, the next time you're feeling you know, stressed, too busy, just think, oh, even a king can meditate. He used to get up at 4 a.m. Maybe I should be getting up a bit earlier doing my meditation. Even the king would make the effort to go and make merits. Maybe I should do it. You know, we have to put forth effort in our lives. Merit doesn't just fall on your plate. <laughs> It'd be nice if it could. It comes through our own actions. We have to put forth effort. Like another question in Australia people often have, they say, oh, Buddhist monks, what are they doing? They're sitting in the forest waiting for people to bring them food. You know, what good do they do? <laughs> or try it. It's not easy to be a Buddhist monk. If it was easy, Dhammagiri would be full of Buddhist monks. <laughs> it's not easy because you have to keep a very high standard of discipline. When you meditate, this morning you were all meditating, you know it's not easy, is it? Your mind is all over the place, thinking many things. Maybe you want to, you know, you've got a pain in your leg, you just want to stop. Or sometimes you have a mood, you're very upset or angry. You want to display your mood, but you're trying to be mindful. It's not easy because you're working with your mind. That's the work that monks do in the forest. They're working with their minds. So maybe they sit there very quiet and you think nothing happening. They're not doing anything good for society. It's not true. They're working with their mind to let go of their negative thoughts, their stress, their worries, their doubts, their anger, their greed. That takes effort. It's that kind of work, spiritual work that monks do. And then they pass on the fruits of that to you, to the laity. That's your good fortune. If you come in contact with monks who practice, then you'll get lots of wisdom from them. You'll get a good example. You'll get wisdom. And you can use that in your, your life. When you're going through suffering, you think, oh, the monks have been through this. They can do it. I'm going to do it. It's normal we go through suffering in life, but we don't always know what to do about it. So take the initiative. Listen to the Dhamma and then put it into practice in your daily life. So merit comes through our actions. We make merit. We do, we perform meritorious actions and this brings us happiness. Like sometimes they compare it to food. And just now you all had a nice meal. Before you eat, you're hungry. You feel there's something missing when you're hungry. There's something, there's a hole in your stomach. You eat, then you feel full and you feel good. The merit is like that. You do something good, you go home, you're still feeling full from that action. Before you do merit, you feel like there's something missing. Your mind is not peaceful, your mind does not feel full, it feels like it's lacking something. But as you practice more merit, whether it's charity and generosity, or keeping precepts, or meditating, listening to Dhamma, your, your mind gradually fills up with merit, you feel better. And if that merit becomes very strong, very full, your mind becomes very full, well, you never feel empty. You never feel at a loss. You always feel like you've got something good inside, whatever's happening outside, whether you're, you know, your, your life is falling apart on the outside, you lose your job, <laughs> you, you have relationship problems, your health is going downhill, uh, World War Three broke out, <laughs> it doesn't matter. These are all external. If you've got merit in your heart, it, it's enough. You can deal with all of these things. Like that, going back to that story, that monk, Lumpo Fun, he lived through the Second World War and he used to meditate on a hill. And people often don't know, but actually there's almost a million Japanese troops in Thailand 
and the Allies, the Americans, the British were bombing Thailand regularly. And where would people go when the bombers would come? They'd go into the monastery. So sometimes these forest monks are sitting on the side of a hill and there's planes going around bombing and they sit and meditate. Everyone gathers around and just meditates. And uh, people felt protected because of the merit of the monks and the place. They think, well, this is the best place to be, um, being in the temples and the monasteries. So Lumpur Phan, uh, he, was, he went through the Second World War and he gave people a lot of support, mental support, spiritual support. And that comes from working with his own mind. He's, they say, people remember him as somebody who had immense kindness and compassion. You, know, you go and pay respects to him, you feel it. You feel the compassion when you meet these people. It's merit. It's the merit of accumulated from years and years of practice. Like one of the monasteries he started is a monastery called Tamkam. It's a cave up in Sakonakon. And a few years ago, the president of our monastery, Jeffrey, he went to stay in that monastery with another great teacher, Lumpur Tate. Um, but they all talked about the time when Lumpur Fun was there. And Lumpur Fun was the first monk to go and stay there, and he stayed in this cave. And there's two caves on the side of a cliff in a huge national park area, big forest, lots of animals. And in one cave was a tiger family. The mum tiger, and she gave birth to three cubs, growing cubs. She has to feed. Lumpur Fun was in the next cave, literally just 10 meters apart. Every night, mother tiger is taking the cubs out who are growing, looking for food, which is usually deer, wild pig, whatever they can get. Every night they go past Lumpur Fun, he's meditating there. Every night, every morning, they come back and they spend their day next to him. That made the front pages of the newspapers in Bangkok. So this is not a normal or easy thing to achieve, to be able to live for months and months next to a tiger family. And they, you know, they could easily have killed him. And people asked him, Lumpur, how can you survive? He said, I just practice loving kindness for the animals. I don't bear them any grudge. I don't bear them, have any fear. I give them security. You know, I'm not a hunter. I just give them compassion. And then I contemplate, my own body is impermanent. I'm going to die anyway. Maybe I'll die from a tiger, maybe from old age, I don't know. But this body is impermanent. I can see it's impermanent, so I'm not afraid of death. I'm not worried about death. He understood that. He understood a human body is impermanent. That's its nature. And he meditated on that every day. So it's very peaceful. So that made the front page of the newspaper in Thailand. You know, when, when somebody lives very simply, and they weren't doing anything um, you know, commercial, or make, they weren't a celebrity or anything, but they just lived very humbly, very simply, did something very good, people recognized that, so they wrote about it. And you can still go to that monastery today. Unfortunately, there's no tigers left. <laughs> you can't test, test it out. The only tigers left are now are in our own hearts. You know, it's another place you have tigers. You know, when you get angry or greedy, it's like a tiger coming up. Those are the tigers we have to tame. So this is what Buddhism is teaching us, how to tame our minds, how to make more merit, do that which brings us true happiness. And perhaps the most um, long-lasting benefit is they say, well, if at the end of this life you're not enlightened yet, you haven't reached Nibbāna, well, what do you take with you into your next life? Your merit. It's like your real wealth, it's your real possession, it's your merit. The good karma, the good you've done in your life, with your family, with society, with the religion, this is what you take with you into your next life. You know, all the physical wealth we have, we can't take with us. We can't take, you know, a house, a car, a bank account, we can't take with us. You know, sometimes when they have funerals, they invite us to chant at a funeral. You go to the funeral and people are stuffing all kinds of things in the coffin. And they put in a, a little model Mercedes Benz and they put in <laughs> fake money and they put in uh, a little iPhone and all kinds of things. And you say, why are you doing that? And they say, well, we want them to have this in the next life. <laughs> 
And then the coffin just gets burnt and all those things get burnt. So clearly you can't take these things with you. What do you take with you? You take your heart, your mind. And the store of good karma, the merit you've made, is what you take this through this life, day by day in this life, and then into your next life. So we should think about that sometimes. You know, why, why were we born as a human being this life? The Buddha's answer is its merits. We've made good karma in the past, which has brought us to be born as a human in this life. You know, if you slipped up last life, you didn't make merit, maybe you'd be born as a kangaroo. <laughs> or something else. It's our merit that brought us here. Why have we come to this monastery? It's because of our merit. We've got good causes and conditions that have led us to be here now. Um, why are we living in a country where there's no war, there's no, not much disaster or famine? You know, Australia is a comfortable, peaceful country to live in. It's not perfect, of course, but it's good enough. And that's our merit. You know, we could have been born anywhere in the world and, and you know, have, a, have a totally different experience. So the Buddhist explanation for this is it's our merit. We accumulate merit this life and it leads us into our next life. But we have to keep practicing. Merit also, it's, you know, it's like anything, it's like fuel in the car or food, it runs out. You have to keep making it, keep doing it. Maybe I'll finish with the story of Visakha. We know from the time of the Buddha, the Lady Visakha, the Buddha praised her as somebody who has a lot of merit, merit and makes merit. And she built a whole monastery, Buparama, famous monastery, and she supported the Sangha every day with food. When the monks were sick, she helped them. So very kind-hearted, very supportive lady. She meditated. She listened to Dhamma and she became a Sotapanna, stream winner. And when she was married, they, in the, those days, you know, the marriage meant she would go to live in the household of her partner with the uh, in-laws. And when you're married, you send a dowry with your daughter to the new household. So they sent some jewelry and cattle and a few things they say she was so kind-hearted. All the animals in the, because it's like a farm, anyone wealthy in those days, they might have business trade, but they also had farm. All the cattle jumped the fence when she left and ran after her. They didn't want to be left behind. She's got so much merit, everything followed. You know, it's like having a, a cattle post out here in Queensland and you know, you, you're going into Brisbane and all the cows follow you. <laughs> It was like that, they said, because her heart was so good, even the cows knew it, and they followed her. So she went to live in her new household, and her husband loved her and treated her very well. All the family loved her. The only person who wasn't quite infatuated with her was father-in-law. Usually the in-laws, it's the problem. <laughs> father-in-law, a very proud man. He had faith in a different sect, not in the Buddha. He had faith, faith in the, the naked ascetics, a totally different system of training from Buddhism. And uh, he's a wealthy man, so he had lots of um, money and power and property. So every day Buddhist monks would walk past and they, they wouldn't receive alms at this house. The father always instructed his servants, they said, I'll just tell those monks to walk on because he didn't have faith in Buddhist monks. So Wisaka was always there, very sad. Oh, we should be giving some food to these monks. We're not, this is not right. But out of respect for her father-in-law, she didn't make a fuss, but she didn't feel right. And then one day she was just near the gate to the courtyard and another monk came by and she just said, oh, venerable sir, no need to wait here. Um, here they're just consuming their old stuff, their own old thing. There's nothing new for you. You should go on. And the father was eating his breakfast there, and he had a sumptuous breakfast, sort of five-star breakfast. So he got really upset. He said, what? What's my daughter-in-law saying? We're just old, eating old things here. You know, I'm very rich. This is the best breakfast in the city. Why is she saying that? So he called her over and said, oh, you've insulted me. How dare you tell these monks I'm just eating old things as though, you know, I've just got a few stale crusts in the fridge or something. He said that. And so she, he said, if you don't like it, you should go home. You don't need to live here anymore. 
And after that, the entire household almost went into riot. They came, gathered around relatives, family, servants. Everyone said, please don't send her away. She's such a good person. And uh, the father said, well, she's insulted me. She shouldn't stay here and insult me. And everyone knew he, you know, perhaps he had a bit, bit of a large ego. We don't know. But everyone knew they didn't want to upset him. But they said, well, why don't you just listen to what she's got to say for herself? At least ask her. So he said, OK, I'll give her one chance. He called Visakha over and he said, so why are you telling these Buddhist monks that we only eat old food here? And she said, oh, well, what I meant was, here you're just using up your old merit. You've been born wealthy and you've accumulated a lot of uh, wealth in this life. You're comfortable, but this is all your old merit, your old good karma. You're not making any new good karma. So there's nothing fresh to give the monks. There's no intention, no aspiration to support the monks. So the father sat and thought, oh, I've never thought of it like this. I've never heard this way of speaking before. He says, so who's your teacher? Who taught you to speak like this? She said, well, my teacher's the Buddha. Would you like to meet him? Oh, okay. <laughs> so she got him. By getting him interested in her way of thinking, she got him to agree to bring, for her to bring the Buddha for a meal. So once the Buddha came, then that was it. The father met the Buddha. He was so impressed with the wisdom of the Buddha, the peace, the, the compassion of the Buddha. After that, he became a student of the Buddha and invited the monks every day to come and receive alms. But it's a very important point. We're using up our old merit here. You've been born human, you're living comfortably, everybody's got a nice house, you've got money, you may want more, but you've got enough to live. You don't have any great pressure on you. But this is old merit, and you've got to keep practicing developing new merit, fresh merit. We make merit through practicing charity, generosity, practicing keeping the precepts, living our lives in an ethical way, not harming others in our speech, our actions, and then developing mindfulness and insight through meditation. This is all what we call merit. And the more we do of this, the happier our mind will become, the more we can let go of our attachment to the world, which is the real source of our suffering. So we're about to give you a final blessing today because it's uh, of this Papa offering. So maybe just before we chant, I'll just wish you all um, success in your practice. May you all continue to make merit just as you've done today. This is something very praiseworthy, very good. I hope that you continue to make merit, you continue to practice and find more happiness. May you have success in your work and your family lives. May you have good health. May you have a mind free from stress and suffering. And may you all attain enlightenment. Um, the, the monk 500 miles away, how does he travel to the uh, Good question. We don't know. I can, we can only guess. Maybe a coincidence that he was there that day. Maybe he knew something that he had to do, just psychically. We don't know. Uh, the, the king go there by the helicopter. Yeah. Saw the man back there. Or oh, the monk could have gone by train to Bangkok, you know, a few days before or whatever. He may have been in Bangkok for business. We don't know. Yeah, but um, then the, the king wanted to, to meet the monk and he used the helicopter and go to the yeah. place. Yeah. So, did he see the monk there? They went and the king around. Yeah, the, the king went to see the monk and heard Dhamma from him. So he but before he, went, before he went in, he checked with all the villagers. What's this monk really like? He wanted to find the back story, you know. He was very smart. And everyone was so inspired with this monk, they all said he's a very good monk. So then the king thought, mm, I better go in and check. And he became a student of that monk. Lumpur Fan regularly went to see the king. Lumpur Fan, Lumpur Juan, Lumpur Wang, Lumpur Te, Lumpur, many, many monks. 
the king became close to and would listen to their dhamma and learn meditation from them. But this was the first. Before that, he didn't know the forest monks. And he went to the forest, like all these bordering provinces, like Udon, Nongkai, Sakonakon, Muktahan, down to Ubon regularly, and up in the north as well, Chiang Mai, Chiang Rai. And you have to remember, through the 60s and 70s, there was communist war in Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. There was always, the biggest fear the Thais had was that Thai would become a communist place, they'd give up Buddhism. So many monks say Buddhism stayed strong in Thailand because of the king. It's almost like they're the same, synonymous. King and Buddhism are one thing. So the king was strong, he had his faith in the whole of the Sangha of Thailand, but in particularly in these border areas, he would visit regularly and support the monks. Those monks had a, v a profound impact on people's lives. So there were many people who weren't interested in communism, weren't interested in following that way because they had something better, they had merit. So it's, a, it's you could even say it's all of your merit, you know, I'm not Thai, but I feel it's my merit that I was born in a time when the king lived. Because that king, he lived for 70 years, supported Buddhism, did an immense amount of good for the country and for Buddhism, and I benefited from that. He, you know, he, I, it was under his reign that I managed to go and live in Thailand, stay there, and was supported. He actually gave me a, a royal title before he died. Uh, I got a royal title for living and practicing Buddhism in Melbourne, but for a contribution to, to Buddhism. So, and he's do, doing that all the time, he's supporting monks all around the world. So it's something very special that we've all been part of in our own small way.